morning, Fellowship Church. I am Miss Nancy, the Children's Ministry Director. And I have never been so proud in my life as I am of what happened this past week. There are some things that happened at VBS this week that were just so touching, so incredible. Um, it's a lot easier for me to stand up here and be goofy <laughs> than it is to be honored and humble and grateful as I am today. Um, Last week, we averaged 80 kids per night. Some nights were higher. Our lowest night was... We gave four Bibles to children who asked for them. We did silly skits. We have wet kids. We had erupting volcano. Some of the highlights were George being called Jesus. Hi, Jesus. Um, like I said, passing out four Bibles to children who wanted them and didn't have them. The pride I have in this congregation, if you participated in any way, shape, or form by donating or leading or telling stories, would you please stand? Because I want everyone to know what the body of Christ looks like when we join together. So please stand. just shy of a hundred volunteers to pull this together. That is unbelievable. Something else that was unbelievable was we had a contest between the boys and the girls. We were raising money for um, Love Incorporated, one of our mission partners. Their need has become so much more profound this year. And the boys and girls raised a total of $748.84 for Love Incorporated this year. These ladies behind me, Ms. Renee, could not have done it without them. They are remarkable ladies. I'm so proud to be a part of their team. Um, Dave Goldman for our erupting volcano. Way to go, Dave. <laughs> um, we have a slideshow. Oh, there it is. It is up and running right now. It is. It was an absolutely glorious week. And tonight, today, we would like to invite our kids who are here to come up and sing a couple of songs with us this morning. So if you were here, you got those great shirts on, even if you don't have those great shirts on. Come on up here, kids. This is all about you. You get to come on up. Come on, Aubrey. Oh, hi, Quinley. All right, Miss Lisa, you're going to lead them? Here she goes.
up for Pastor Mike, I think. Where is that special delivery? Maybe it dropped out of his plane. I think we found it. It washed up on shore when Sky Lucander crashed his plane this week. Chocolate. <laughs> yes. All right, kids. Mine, the, mine, 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 mine. <laughs> on the count of three, let's say we love you, Pastor Mike. One, <laughs> two, three. We love you, Pastor Mike. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so this week we learned we did a song every day called Every Day. And I want you guys to repeat after me every day. Every day. It's you I live for. It's you I live for. All right, that's simply the most of the song or those words right there. We're going to leave the kids are going to worship, but I need you to stand up and sing along with us. The words will be on the screen. Here we go. Every day. Every day. It's you I live for. It's you I live for.
There. <laughs> no, I'm joking when I say that. Harshly. <laughs> For those of you um, this morning who may be guests here, um, the idea behind the milk can and all that, I'm going to be taking just a few weeks off just to kind of get refreshed in a season of ministry and maybe do some studying and, and uh, think of some new things to say after a few years here. So. Uh, that's where the chocolate comes from. And I'll leave it right here because there's no way possible I'm going to eat all of that while I'm gone. Because if I did, I'd need new pants or something like that. So I'll leave it right here. And as you're leaving today, if you want to kind of circle up in this direction, grab a piece of chocolate on your way out, that'd be fantastic. Sound okay? So before I leave, I want you all to say, Pastor Mike's a nice guy because he shares his chocolate. Ready? Go. <laughs> Pastor Mike's a nice guy because he shares his chocolate. There it is. All right. I, I really love you people. I, I love you not, not just because of what happened here this past week. And boy, I was all ready with the, you know, boys rule, girls drool thing. But then the girls caught up in the last day and collected more money. So now I guess it's girls rule, boys drool. And that hurts a little bit to say that. But, um, you know, I just love you folks. Um, so thanks for this past week. But thanks for every week, really. Because a church isn't made on one week, right? We do things, and we, we find ways to reach into the community and tell them that we love them, and, and we invite folks in here, and we love to do those kind of things. But no church is ever built on one week, all right? We do what we do because we love God and know that he loves us. And, and um, so I'm, I'm proud of all of you. Love you all. Did you see that song that we just sang a minute, though? It said something about um, that God is jealous for us. Did you see that in that song? How many of you feel uncomfortable with the idea that God gets jealous? Okay, I do, because what do we tell our kids from the time that they're little? 
that jealous is not a good thing, right? And that we shouldn't be jealous of certain things, but understand how God sees that word, at least from his perspective. When we feel jealous about something in this life, it's because we say, that's not yours, that belongs to me, right? Or I deserve what you have or something, and therefore I'm going to be jealous of you because you have something and I feel like I, it belongs to me as well. Here's why it's okay for God to be jealous. Because in the Bible, God looks at you, people, and says, the world can't have you. I'm jealous for you. I'm jealous for you. Why? Because you're mine. N not in a childish, selfish, immature kind of way, but in a possessive way in which God says, I know who you are even when you forget who you are. So when you forget who you are, God says, I'm jealous for you. Why? Because you belong to me. There, now you're thinking Carly Simon song already, aren't you? Yep, got that thing stuck in your head. All right, we'll sing that next week. But there it is. It's, it's God saying, you belong to me. You don't belong to some of the things of the world that you're in right now. You belong to me instead. And you are precious to me. So when God says, I'm jealous for you, that's not our way of saying, God, you shouldn't feel that way. That's naughty. We tell our kids not to do that. That's the, really, God, you'd be jealous of somebody like me? Like, you'd be that possessive. Of somebody like me? God, do you have any idea what I've done in my life? And God says, yes, I know everything you've done in your life. But I'm jealous for you anyway because you still belong to me. And I claim what's mine. Somebody say, way cool. Way cool. All right, will you pray with me, please? God, thanks for this day and thanks for blessing us so. Thanks for a great week of vacation Bible school. Thanks for Nancy and for all the work that she put in behind the scenes, and for all the other volunteers, set design, laying out curriculum, the snacks, the games, everything else that we had this past week, Father, it was a great week. But Father, we don't want to get hung on weeks. We want to just continue to be the people you call us to be, and to recognize that we're loved every day, that we're loved on our best days, and then on our not-so-best days. We're still loved. So thank you for that, and Father, may our lives reflect that this coming week. So that regardless of <laughs> whether or not this past week was a good week or not, Monday morning we can look at ourselves in the mirror and say, I know I'm loved. By the God who created the heavens and the earth, I know I'm loved. And I know that he sent his son to die on a cross to save me from my sins. And therefore God is fully accepting of me, all open arms, all grace. And God's desire is to draw me in closer day by day. Father, thank you for that realization and it's always nice when we can talk about it on Sunday mornings here, but God, I pray that we'd know it when we're out there. And for somebody here this morning, that it just might change the way they think of themselves, and it just might change the way they live. God, we pray the exact same for all the kids that were here this past week. They certainly hear, heard day by day that you love them and you have a plan for their life. Father, help them to hang on to that message because they're going to need it. There are so many things in this world, oh God, that tell us that we're not sufficient or that we don't measure up or that we're, we're not all that because we don't have these things. But God, in, in your eyes, we're right where you want us to be. And may your arms be open this morning as well and keep drawing us deeper and deeper into you. That's our prayer. Thanks for all the things that you blessed us with, homes and cars and clothes and, and the ability to provide for ourselves. Thank you for that. Father, we're grateful for a church so that as we try to learn more about you and live out our faith, none of us has to do this alone. That would be impossible. We need each other more than we know and more than we'll admit. Father, may you continue to bless this body of Christ. And we pray that every church in town would be having a great day together as well today. Uh, we, we pray for all of them. Um, Father, we pray for, for anyone in our church family or people that we know and love who may have some, some illnesses or some difficulties going on in their life. Uh, Father, for people who have been hospitalized recently, for folks who are still going through treatments for one thing or another, for, for cancer and other illnesses. Uh, Father, for people who have had surgeries or are looking toward a surgery coming up, we pray for healing. We pray that your hand would be upon them. And God, we pray as well for people whose wounds and hurts don't always show on the outside. For anyone here with a broken relationship, Maybe someone here who's, who's had a few turns in life that didn't turn out the way they thought it would, or 
Maybe there's just been some things happening and it's caused a lot of discouragement. Father, we pray for them as well. And Father, you're a healer in every sense of that word, physically, emotionally, spiritually, relationally. We pray for all of that. And thanks for loving us. We pray for the world that we live in as well and pray that you would lead and guide, be with our nation today, be with our community. We pray, oh God, that you would lead and guide even during the times in our life when we lose sight of you because you sure never lose sight of us. So we pray that you would direct us and for each one of us here this morning, oh God, show us one more thing this morning, maybe something we knew in the past and, and lost track of, or maybe it's something that's brand spanking new. Show us at least one thing about this faith you've given to us so that as we live it this week, we can say, hey, I, I've got something I'm working on. This is that new thing. Or here's a new way of dealing with people. Or here's a new way of thinking of myself. Or whatever it may be, oh God. Just continue to grow us and bless us. And we are so grateful to be called your children. And we love you more than we can say. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Friends, I'm going to invite you to turn with me in your Bibles, if you have them a book in the Old Testament. It's a book called Deuteronomy. If you don't have a Bible in front of you, that is completely okay. Um, you can just listen as I read these words, and we're going to come back to several of these verses, so, so it'll be freshened up in a few minutes. It's in the Old Testament. It's a book of Deuteronomy. It's the fifth book from the beginning, so if you're not sure where to find it, you can just start at the first book and work your way through. It's five books in. And I'll explain this in just a minute because we're jumping in mid-story. And here's what it says. God speaking. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. Wow. The Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than other peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your forefathers that he brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery, from the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know, therefore, that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. There's more there than we can talk about in a while this morning. But friends, this is God's word. May God, as always, be pouring his word into this place. May it be alive in this place. And may it be alive in every heart as well. Amen. So let me start with a bit of an illustration, and this might not make sense at first, but just give me a couple of minutes. I grew up out in a town near Byron Center. If you know where Byron Center, Michigan is, that was kind of podunk back then, didn't look anything then that it looks now, and lived on a gravel road. There was an elementary school right around the corner from my house, and that elementary school had one grade for each grade level, and it only went from kindergarten up through fourth grade. So there were a total of five classrooms in the whole school, kindergarten, first, second, third, fourth. Right now you're thinking, Pastor Mike, that sounds like Little House on the Prairie. No, we didn't carry our lunch in buckets, but it was close, right? And I walked back and forth to school there every day. And when, um, when, when recess time would come, we'd always play games. Recess, by the way, was my favorite subject, bar none. Gym was my second favorite subject, but that was structured. So recess is whatever you want to do, right? as long as you don't get hurt, and most of the time that worked. And quite often, at recess time, we'd play a game called kickball. Now, kickball, if you're not familiar with it, kickball is a lot like baseball, except that instead of a bat and a small ball and gloves, you use this round rubber ball that some genius named a rubber snot. <laughs> now, I don't know what kind of college you have to go through to come up with a name like that. But every time we said that word, we giggled a little bit, right? It's the rubber snot, huh? right? We'd have... But it was a rubber snot, and, and we'd play kickball practically every recess. And the morning, the afternoon, at lunchtime, we just played kickball all the time. And the way that we'd normally play kickball is that we'd take all the kids that wanted to play, and we'd kind of sign them up according to teams. And usually there was a couple of captains, and all the other kids would stand out there in a crowd, and the captains would choose the kids. Now, I should say up front, that when I was in elementary school, I was probably a little on the smaller side, and I was skinny. A belt was not a fashion statement. A belt was cinched tight and meant to hold my pants up, right? So I was a little on the skinny side, which means that I usually wasn't in the first tier of kids chosen. 
I was lucky if I made the second tier. Although there certainly were times when, based on previous performance, it kind of felt something like, hey, why don't you guys take Mike? <laughs> really, like, we got enough players on our team, why don't you guys take Mike, or you take Mike along with these kids, you guys just scatter yourselves around and stay out of the way of the rest of us type of thing. Because when I was of that age, I couldn't catch that ball to save my life. Not when it was kicked high and long, and I couldn't catch that ball to save my life. So I certainly wasn't first tier. I wasn't often second tier. It was more like the, Mike, why don't you just go stand out in the field and stay out of the way of the rest of us? We can giggle at that. But if you've been in a place like that in your life, you know what that feels like, don't you? Because when you're one of the kids who's standing up there waiting for one of those captains to say, I want you on my team. That are, those are the longest moments of your life, right? Because nobody wants to be the last kid chosen. Nobody wants to be in the, oh, why don't you take Mike group? Because he's not going to catch it anyway, right? To this day, if I drive past a playground and see kids choosing teams, it still sticks me in the heart a little bit. Because that's an awful feeling to be in a place where you're waiting for somebody to say, I want you on my team, and that wait just seems to go on forever and ever. So I remember one day when we were playing kickball, and Mr. Heisinger was always the referee and kind of the, the, the pitcher and so on. He's a gym teacher, right, Mr. Heisinger? And Jeff Wilson came up to the plate. Now, Jeff Wilson was bigger than the rest of us. He was a man-child. He had a thunder leg. He had a mustache that you didn't need mascara to color in to see it. With the rest of us kids, he was a little mascara and stuff. Jeff had a real honest-to-goodness mustache. He was, he was shaving in fourth grade, I think. So when Jeff came up, all of us kids, especially the skinny kids, we started backing up, thinking he's going to pound this thing into the next zip code or something like that. And Mr. Heisinger pitched it. And Jeff reared back that leg of his and gave it a boot. And it was headed straight for me. And I was already thinking, Jeff, we're friends, but right now I hate you, man, or something like that. <laughs> thinking this is going to look really bad. I never moved my feet. I just kind of stood there watching it come at me. And as that ball's coming closer and closer, I think I just kind of stuck my arms out and turned my head and closed my eyes like this. See, let's just see what happens. And that ball just kind of settled into my arm, right? And I heard Mr. Heisinger yell, out. And to this day, I'll swear, the heavens parted and the angelic chorus was singing the hallelujah or something. Hallelujah. There it is. This this skinny fourth grader with the belt cinched tight holding onto that ball like, did I just really catch that thing? And with that newfound confidence later in that recess, I caught another one. Now, you might say, well, Pastor Mike, big whoop. I mean, it's a kid playing kickball, right? Here's the cool part about it. The next time we got together as kids and played kickball, I was a first-tier guy. Like, all of a sudden, something changed. Hey, skinny Mike can actually catch that thing. So all of a sudden, it's not me and all the other kids standing off to the side like the, oh, please pick me, Jesus, please pick me, Jesus. All of a sudden, it's somebody saying, I'll take Mike. You play the outfield. We need you out there. Now, that might sound silly to you, but I'll bet you've had a time in your life when somebody whom you looked up to looked at you, pointed the finger, and said, I want you. I'll take you to be with me. I can think of 50 different places in this life where that would be such a redeeming thought, like a, really? You, you want me to be with you right now? Think job. That time that you received the job that you were hoping for, and somebody in management, HR, whatever, said, yes, we've chosen you. Don't tell me that doesn't feel good. Picture some teenagers at a dance, and they're all kind of standing around the outside, and somebody's waiting for somebody to go first, and some bold person crosses the room, looks at you, and says, want to dance? Uh, I, I choose you. Out of all the other kids here, I choose you. That'll change a person's life. When somebody whom you look up to, somebody who's in a place that you would respect and honor, when that person says, I want you to be with me, you're on my team, or you're on my project now, or whatever it may be, I want a relationship with you. When that happens, it can be a life changer, and it changes the way people think about themselves. 
Because when somebody says, I choose you, it allows a person to feel value. You following me? All of a sudden, there's a sense of value there that says, somebody else wanted me. They saw something in me for which they said, I want you with me. And there's value. Can you hold that thought for just a minute? I want to take you back into the scripture passage that we read. Okay, a little background behind it. Um, If you know anything about the first few books of the Bible, there's the people of God, and there's Genesis, there's Exodus, they're off in slavery, they're brought out of slavery, they make it through the promised land, and just about the time they're at the brink of the promised land, ready to run in and grab that land like a bunch of black shoppers outside of Best Buy, Moses says, hang on a minute, God wants to say something to us before we go in there. This is not the Black Friday time. This is God wanting to speak something to you. And so God gives them the entire book of Deuteronomy. It's a 33 chapter long sermon. If you ever think we're long here, go read Deuteronomy in one sitting, all right? Because it's 33 chapters long and it goes on forever and ever. But here's something I want you to see again this morning. This is what God said to them. The Lord your God has chosen you to be his people, his treasured possession. All right, we're going to break down just a couple of phrases this morning. I want you to think about what it might mean for you to be a treasured possession. Now, when we had VBS, Vacation Bible School, this past week, part of it on the last night was finding this treasure chest, right? And inside the treasure chest is something that's obviously very valuable because that's what you put inside of a treasure chest. If there's a treasure chest there, you assume that what's inside of it has value and meaning to somebody. And maybe you have a place in your home or a place in your life where you take the things that matter the most to you and you put them there, right? Like my wife and I have this little little safe downstairs that's supposed to be uh, supposed to be protected from fire or something and that's where we keep things like birth certificates and passports and all that kind of stuff. It's the stuff we can't easily replace. So it, it goes in the box. Did you ever stop to think that maybe God has a place like that? Yeah, apparently. I mean, with everything that heaven is, And heaven's a pretty cool place. I mean, everything I read in the Bible tells me that, wow, it's way beyond description. It's beyond what Mike's meager little mind can comprehend. God says, I also have a special place where I keep things that look like treasure to me, special value, and oh, by the way, you're in the box. I don't know how you think of yourself every day. I don't know what you thought of yourself this past week. I don't know what you're thinking when you roll out of bed, matted hair and all that, look at yourself in the mirror, and say, it's another day i got to get ready. But here's what God says. Of all the things on this planet, of all the things that I created, of all the things that you look at and say, wow, that's beautiful, God says to me, you go in my treasure box. Of all the things that God could put in the treasure box, God says, I'd rather put you in that treasure box than anybody or anything else, because you are the most valuable thing in the world to me. Now, this might sound kind of silly to you, but I'm going to guess it's probably be meaningful to somebody. I want you to say, I am God's treasured possession. We're going to say it three times, because the first time I know you, you're going to mumble it, okay? So we're going to get past the mumble, then we're going to say it clearly, then we're going to say it loudly. Fair enough? Fair enough? Okay. Now, this is going to sound weird because it's always easy to look at somebody else and say, that person, because of everything they have going for them, that person is God's treasured possession. But that's not what that passage says. It says you're his treasured possession. Ready? One, two, three, go. I am God's treasured possession. Again, I am God's treasured possession. Now say it like you mean it. I am God's treasured possession. Now, to say that on a Sunday morning in a gathering that's a big brick building, it's not too difficult. But this coming week, when you're having that bad moment, perhaps because of something that you didn't live up to, I wonder what it would feel like in that moment for you to say, I'm God's treasured possession. Because that's a pretty cool phrase. For God to say, of all the things in this planet, you go in my treasure chest. That ought to change the way that you value yourself. It ought to change the way you think about yourself, and it ought to change the way that you think about other people. Now, notice how we get to be a treasured possession. Look at that verse again. That's God saying, I 
chose you. It's not as if you said, I really, really, really want to be special to God, and because of all the things that I've done in my life, I'm going to choose God. I'm going to choose to be on God's side, God's team, whatever metaphor you want to use. That's not what it says. Instead, this is God saying, you didn't choose me. You wouldn't know enough to choose me. I chose you. And here's the kicker. God didn't say, I waited for you to clean up your act, and then I chose you. I waited for you to have a really good day, and I chose you on the good day. I waited for you to get everything just right in your life, and then I chose you. That is not the way the story reads. Go back and read it. That's God saying, even when you weren't right where I wanted you to be, and even when you weren't completely who I wanted you to be, I chose you. And that'll change the way you think about on your less than perfect days. Let's go farther. You read this too. The Lord did not set his affection on you. Oh, we got to come back to that in a second. And choose you because you were more numerous than other peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples. Here's what I gained from that verse. It tells me that God doesn't think like I do. Sometimes you and I probably get into the habit of thinking that God is just the better version of me. That God's a lot like me. God loves all the things that I love and doesn't like the things that I don't like, but God is just a better version of me, just bigger and better. That's not true at all. Because God says, I, I want you to imagine how you would have done the choosing if I'd put you in charge. Well, I'd have chosen all the gifted, talented people right up front, right? Like, this person has a lot to contribute. This person has something going on in their life. This one fits really well into the overall plan. I would have probably chosen on some kind of qualification. That's not what it says. God says, if I'd wanted to choose based on number or qualification or what the world might say, wow, there's a lot of hope with that one, God says, you wouldn't be it. Well, that, that hurts a little bit, God. But here's the cool thing behind it. God says, I didn't, ba I didn't choose you based on any kind of worldly qualifications. So however the world does the choosing, God says, I don't choose like that. However this world says we value people based on these qualifications, these characteristics, this kind of a sliding scale, God says you can throw that out when you think of me because I don't choose based on that. Here's how God chooses. I just chose you because I loved you. Guess how much you get to bring to the table in that? God doesn't say, I chose you because I know that you love me. If it said that, I'd go to bed every night thinking, wow, I messed that one up. Because every day I'd be thinking, it was based upon me once again, and I failed. That's not what it says. It says and says, it's not based on me. It's based on God looking at me and saying, I chose you. And I didn't wait for you to get everything perfect in your life first. I just chose you. So you had nothing to do with it. And about the time I want to say, well, God, look what I'm bringing to the table. I brought this stuff to the table so that you would like me more and choose me. God says, that means nothing to me. I chose you because I loved you. And I didn't wait for you to choose me back. I didn't wait for you to love me back. I didn't wait for any kind of a really cool response. I didn't wait for one of those on your knees moments before me. I chose you, and here's the people of Israel, I chose you when you had no desire to choose me back. I chose you anyway. You know what that tells me? It tells me that first of all, God values things very differently than we do. Because when we love, we're always looking for some kind of a response of love. And we'll love more when the response of love is there, right? It's easier to love when the love is returned. That's how we love. God says, I didn't wait for your response. I just loved you unconditionally right now. And there it is. Now you see that place where it says, set his affection? In the original language of the Bible, it literally means that God set his heart upon you. creator of the universe who can create anything he wants with a spoken word 
all-powerful, everywhere present, all-knowing, not lacking anything. That God set his heart on you. It literally means he put his heart upon you so that God's heart would be on you. I wonder if you would think of yourself any differently knowing that God set his heart upon you. And guess what? God did the exact same thing with other people as well. I wonder if you treat anybody different this coming week. Yeah, that's right, that person. I wonder if you treat that person differently this week. If you could look at him and say, you know what? I think God set his heart on that one too. Thank you for cutting me off in traffic, but I know that God set his heart on you too, right? Or something like that. Left lever, blinker, try it next time. God still set his heart on you. Because that's how God works. So God already set his affection upon you. Now let me share with you my favorite verse in the whole Bible. I know I say that every week, but here's this one. It comes out of 1 John 3. It says, how great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God, and that is what? That is what we are. That is not what you'll be someday when you finally get this faith thing all figured out. That is not what it says. God says, I'm in the loving business, and I choose because I love. I don't choose because I put you through some kind of a process and decided that you measured up decent. You checked enough boxes, and therefore I chose you. No, God said instead, I chose you just because you're you. And I chose you because I love you. And nothing can change it. That's not performance-based. It's not the, God's going to love me if I just lose a few pounds, color my hair, and update my wardrobe. All right? That's how the world thinks of love, right? We love based on certain characteristics. God says, I love free from any of those worldly characteristics. I just love. And when I love, I choose. And when I choose, nothing can change the choosing. On your best day, you're still chosen. On your worst day, you're still chosen. And since the love isn't earned, the love is always there. So here's what that means for you. It means that every day this coming week, regardless of what the previous day looked like, regardless of what last week looked like, last month, last year, regardless of the things that go well in your life and the things that don't go well in your life. The God of the heavens looks upon you and says, I love you and I choose you. That lends incredible value to people like us. And maybe for anybody who's here this morning or, or somebody who's going to watch it later, if somebody's watching this thing and they're thinking, I don't matter. My life isn't as important as so-and-so. I've been treated in a certain way by people so that I don't feel so valued, and I don't feel like I matter, and I don't feel like I'm worth much. Because this world can do that to people. And people can do that to people. The God of the heavens, the God who created you, the God who formed you, the God who loves you more than anything, still looks at you and says, yeah, but I chose you. And if the world doesn't know enough to choose you, that's because the world chooses wrong. I choose you. And I want you all to myself. And when the world gets in the way, I get jealous. So I come looking back for you again. And just to make sure you get it, God says, I sent my son Jesus for you. So if you get nothing else this morning from our time together, May you know that you're loved. May you know that you're chosen. And I'm just wondering how you'd live tomorrow if you really believed all of that to be true. Will you pray with me, please? God, that's not the first time we've talked about things like that. We honestly talk about your love for us all the time. But God, I know that I can become desensitized to those things over time, that when I've heard it and then heard it and then heard it again, after a while it kind of loses a little bit of track with me. And so God, my prayer is that for all of us together, we'd hear it and know it. And that maybe just something 
would strike a chord in our hearts today like, like maybe it hasn't in the past. And maybe this morning somebody would leave here and say, I think I finally got it. Of all the things in the world, of all the people in the world, of all the, of all the things in this world that God could look at and say, that's my treasure, God looks at me. And it's one thing to be chosen to play a game with a ball called a rubber snot. It's something else to be chosen for life. And that you would look at each one of us and say, I choose you. And I love you. Thanks, oh God. This week, my prayer is that you'd set on our hearts on a regular basis, how would we live if we really believed it to be true? Because we're still God's first choice. And we're so grateful to you for that. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Our Bible verse this week was out of 1 John 4, 9. That while... <laughs> kids, if you know it, will you stand up for me real quick? All the kids are in here. Our scripture this week, come do it with me. The kindergartners actually came up with all the motions, so it's kind of cool. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. So everybody, would you stand on your feet and let's sing about how God so loved us.
means that's far more than just a song that we sing in church on a Sunday morning. That is a reality of the world that you live in. That the God of the heavens, the God of all power, the God of all creation, he loves you more than you'll ever know, and that God chooses you. We don't know enough to choose until God reaches out and says, I want you. And that lends incredible value to our life when we recognize that God says, you're mine. May you know that before you leave here today. Friends, if you're one of our guests this, this morning, there are some gift bags in the coffee area in the back. Please take one with you. We're really glad to have you with us this morning. Please come back again soon. If you'd like somebody to pray over you before you leave, you can come down to the front. We'd love to pray over you. It's also after, this, after, um, after we're finished here this morning, it's our baptism service this morning. We do that once a year down at Wolf Lake, down at Beals Park. And last night I was praying, God, it'd be really nice if we could do that without a thunderstorm taking place at the same time. <laughs> and guess what? The rain stopped. How cool is that? So we'll be down at Beals Park in another half hour, 45 minutes, and we'll celebrate baptism there. Love to have you down there with us as well. Friends, as you leave this place today, may you take with you God's grace and his mercy and his peace. He pours it out upon all of us through Jesus Christ, his Son, our Savior and Lord. Amen.